Hello, and welcome to NAEA's second town hall, art education and social emotional learning, taking care of our learners and ourselves. It's a very special conversation with some awesome guests that have joined us this evening. I'm Mario Rosero. I'm the executive director of the National Art Education Association. And like many of you, I have a background in the visual art classroom as an elementary middle school teacher for 10 years. And then I spent a lot of time in central office administration in Pittsburgh Public Schools and Chicago Public Schools before uh, joining the Kennedy Center and then uh, ending my journey here at the National Art Education Association where we are thrilled to work with our great members and art educators all across the country. Before we get started this evening, I just wanted to take a minute to um, have some space to acknowledge um, everything that everyone has lived through this year. There are multiple layers that we're all facing and dealing with, uh, depending on who you are and where you might be uh, uh, across the country. And so we just wanted to create some space to acknowledge everything that we've been living through. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the First Nations and the First Peoples and the land that we all occupy and that we're on currently and just send our respect out to those folks. So just take a second. So you might be wondering why we are doing these town halls and we uh, have been really busy like many of our sister organizations supporting educators in the classrooms uh, for all ages. And we wanted to move from uh, documents and guidance and advice to conversations and to make this come to life. So we really wanna meet educators where they are right now. So uh, once a month, we'll have a town hall conversation that really is geared towards a burning issue or topic that our field is facing. We wanna make that come to life. But in order to live up to that town hall ethos, uh, we receive questions from members in advance and from attendees in advance. And so what you'll hear are uh, members' voices, practitioners' voices in the questions that we address in our conversation tonight, which is really exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about the format. So we're doing something that's unique. It's called the long conversation. That doesn't mean that it's going to be three hours long. It means that it's an extended conversation across uh, pairings of individuals. So essentially what you can expect are, it's kind of like a relay race of two person dialogues. So uh, you'll see two people start the conversation and they'll have six minutes. At the five minute mark, you'll hear and that'll be the signal that we have one minute left to wrap up. That conversation will wrap up. You may hear the final chime of the bell ring and then one person will exit and the next person will come on and you'll see a new combination for that pairing and so on and so forth. And what you see are these vignettes of these intimate conversations. And we feel really confident that we put together a panel of experts that have very different perspectives, but all are based in uh, education and really caring about our learners and our educators. And so hopefully you'll leave with some really practical tips and strategies. So, I think that's most of what you need to know to get started. Um, we suggest having uh, this on speaker view is the best way to view this. Uh, also know that we are streaming on Facebook Live right now. We're thrilled that we have over 540 folks that registered. It's really exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. And also uh, please keep the chat active. Any questions that you might have and if folks wanna to respond to each other throughout the dialogue, please keep the chat active. Um, we also have time. I'm going to work really hard to have 10 or 15 minutes at the end to do some live Q&A with our guests. And so I'll be pulling as best I can from the chat to address some things that don't come up in our conversations naturally. So I think we are ready to start our first conversation. Uh, so I'm really thrilled and honored to welcome our first guest, uh, Karen Van Osdell. Karen is the Senior Director of Practice and I consider her the, an overall SEL guru uh, at CASEL. And if you don't know, CASEL is the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And I have to add, it's an extra pleasure for me to have Karen here because we worked together for a number of years in Chicago Public Schools, and I just admire her so much. So Karen, welcome. Oh, thank you. Right back at you, Mario. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. So you look, I know you've been in the social emotional learning space for a while, and I bet you see a lot. Uh, I'm just curious, what, what are the trends that you're seeing currently that are rising up? 
Well, I mean, I think certainly with where we are in terms of remote learning and hybrid learning and returning to buildings, I, you know, I, it's exciting to see that people are really, really putting social emotional learning at the forefront of that work and really centering relationships in ways that we may not have even seen before. So a little bit of a silver lining of this moment, I think, for SEL. I think also thinking about what this means for adults. A lot of people think of SEL as really, you know, curriculum programming, a learning environment for students, but really a lot more attention to what does this mean to have adult SEL to focus on the well-being of adults uh, as necessary for the health and wellness of our schools and districts overall. Um, and then I think we've also talked a lot about what does it mean to do SEL as a lever for equity? Mm -hmm. And that is a huge conversation across the nation right now and really thinking about what does that mean to build the types of environments and learning experiences that contribute to equitable outcomes for students. Absolutely. And I, you know, I think uh, what we're seeing in the arts is very similar, which is there, um, even though this is not an easy time for anyone, and especially as an arts educator in the classroom, that can be especially challenging with multiple la layers of responsibility on your shoulders. But at the same time, we are seeing an increased value for uh, that creative connection, that expression, the ability to, you know, communicate and reflect what's going on right now. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that this topic of social emotional learning in the arts has been so um, popular in terms of folks want to know more, right? Yeah. So um, sort of building off your, the equity piece you just mentioned. So I know your organization just did a cultural analysis report on social emotional learning and equity. And so one of our members, Michelle from North Carolina was curious, how do you see cultural responsiveness and social emotional learning overlapping? Yeah, I love that question. And I think we see a lot of overlap. Um, and we've been talking a lot recently about sort of three pillars of identity, agency, and belonging. And you might be familiar with sort of the five core competencies of social emotional learning. So, you know, how do I understand myself as a person, my strengths, my biases, my identity, both cultural, personal, collective? How do I build relationships, or take agency? You know, what does it look like to have voice and choice in an arts classroom, in our school buildings overall? Um, and then how do we really create a sense of belonging, which ties to this notion of relationship building? And what does that mean to ensure that we belong to ourselves, that we belong to our environments overall? I, I love that. You know, we've been doing a lot of um, equity work. We have a, a commission that's dedicated to this and it's, it's very parallel conversations about, you know, always start with the eye, start with yourself and work out. And it's, you know, sometimes it's those tough conversations, but you know, how are we all reflective practitioners, right? And to better understand ourselves so that then we can reach out and work with others. So that's right. that really resonates with me. So, you know, many of my fellow uh, art educators, um, you know, they find a natural connection between the arts and social emotional learning. And, you know, we can name a number of things, whether that's creating a safe space or expressing tough ideas and feelings. Uh, but a uh, colleague, Karen from New Jersey, um, she asked, how do we promote social emotional learning without crossing the line of what we are and what we are not professionally trained to do? And, you know, so I really, I, I really hear that question, like, where's that line and, and where's that comfortable space for us to be in? Yeah, that's a great question and one we hear a lot. And I think, you know, one thing I would reiterate is that if you really tap into, uh, you know, what is the mission of your school, of your classroom, of your teaching, that probably has to do with building well-rounded, holistic human beings, right? And I think when we talk about social emotional learning, we are talking about building those skills that we mentioned before, and you're probably already doing it as an uh, arts educator. You're building norms in your classroom. You are allowing for a reflection on relationships and working together for a project. You're helping students to persist through challenges. All of that is social emotional learning. So I would just say, you know, it's about being intentional about that and thinking of that as part of your areas of growth for your lessons as well. I appreciate that. And, you know, I might also encourage folks, you know, um, sort of finding those natural connections. I really appreciate that. Uh, and I think it's also, you know, to the degree that someone has the, the attention and focus to, to learn some of the more concrete um, and, and like research practices, it's, it's always a strength and a benefit to be able to name what you're doing, especially to administrators or parents. So I think that's also like a potential next step that folks might be thinking about. Love that. Um, so we have so many good questions from um, our audience. So 
Um, there's a curious curiosity around, um, so, you know, oftentimes the art room is a safe space for expression and whether you're a uh, uh, elementary, middle school, high school teacher, you're in the college space or even a community teaching artist, um, oftentimes there can be moments where um, you see some trauma come up from, from, from a student. So can you just help us think through like, um, how should we even start to address that piece when it comes up? Yeah. Uh, you know, another conversation is really around you know, trauma responsive or trauma informed practice. And it, I know our arts educators are doing this. They're creating reliable, safe environments. They're creating routines and care for students. And I think if something moves into more of a clinical realm, that's why we have these support teams often in schools. So that's drawing on student support team or a care team, some folks may call it. So you've got psychologists, social workers, counselors that may be in your building. So I would encourage you to refer to those folks, to talk to the classroom teacher as well, just so that we are building on the systems that we have in our schools. I love that. And it's like, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this is to remind folks you're not alone. You have colleagues that are here and care about you and we all have strategies and when we share them, we can get stronger and remember that those colleagues are in your building or in your community and lean on them. I love that. Um, so uh, as we, you know, our, our time's getting close here. So uh, my last question for you is, you know, what are you doing to uh, take care of your, what's your self-care tips for you that you're doing right now? Thank you for that question. Um, I have definitely become more intentional about self-care in these last few months. And I think probably the biggest for me is I live I'm about a mile from Lake Michigan here in the Chicago area. So I try to see nature every day and to get a little exercise and to get a little vitamin D and just really build that in even when it seems inconvenient or when the weather's not perfect. So that's been my, my big tip for this last few months. Absolutely. And having lived in Chicago, I know that you'll be uh, fully bundled up here <laughs> in another week or so. So keep up those walks. Um, Karen, uh, you know, always great talking to you. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure, Mario. Thank you. And I have the honor of welcoming Lindsay Vance to the conversation. So Lindsay is going to join us. She is an art therapist, a fine artist, an educator, and an arts administrator with the DC Public Schools. So welcome, Lindsay. Hello, Karen. Nice to chat with you. Good to chat with you. Um, I'm impressed with the number of hats that you wear, and I'm curious in your role as a visual arts manager with DC Public Schools, you know, how are your teachers doing right now? How are they coping? Well, you know, during these multiple de pandemics that we're experiencing, it is quite overwhelming. There's a lot of anxiety. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. Um, teachers are adjusting very well. However, they are finding new ways to teach, doing things they've never done. Um, and we've had the honor of being able to involve an out of school time program here, a local nonprofit project create to bring in some art therapists uh, to work with our teachers and, and do monthly workshops on coping and um, just kind of collaborating and creating together, which I think has really helped uh, keep some of that cohesiveness among teachers who are kind of maybe feeling isolated at this time, um, and really just pushing our students forward by making sure that we keep the arts as strong as possible, even as we're virtual. I love that. And I love hearing that connection to a, attending to adult SEL just as we attend yes, to our students' yes. SEL. So that's great, Lindsay. Um, we had a really interesting question from Deborah in Texas. And she is asking about the evolution of the social emotional learning field. And then you know, her thought was that social emotional learning has really always been embedded in art. And can you talk a little bit about how you see SEL being embedded in arts education? Absolutely. I think one of the greatest things about art is it naturally lends itself to social emotional learning. Um, and so because that, uh, we're able to kind of naturally do things that help us to self explore and to explore our environment and our culture and, and all of those things. But when we're really intentional, kind of as you said earlier, um, and creating routine and consistency around that, that's when we see the greatest greatest growth um, and giving our young people an opportunity to really kind of dig into um, their feelings and what's going on with them and what's going on with the world, particularly right now. I think it's super important uh, that we create that safe space for students to be able to explore um, through art making. And it's just a natural way. I, I, art, as an art therapist, I know that art is one of those things that you don't always have the words for what's going on, but you definitely have some images. So it's a, a way to kind of get all of that stuff that's on the inside out. Yeah, 
That's amazing. And I think, you know, to the point around sort of how this has evolved over time, it's really, you know, we've learned a lot about what, how learning happens and the context that that happens, that it's really happening all the time and that it's happening in different modes. And, you know, as much as we can give space to allow young people to practice their social emotional competencies, to model it as an adult, I think, you know, what you're describing is really powerful, Lindsay. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, a question, you know, we know that educators are dealing with so many layers right now. And one of our members from Karen from New Jersey is thinking about this too. She talks about COVID, bullying, unemployment, political conflict, racism. You know, should we be addressing those types of controversial and complex topics in the classrooms at this time in our art classrooms? I, my answer to that is absolutely we should. Um, and I think the best way to do it is to do it safely and to know that, you know, some things may be triggering, things may bring up a lot. And so um, to avoid it, it, it doesn't help. Actually, we really do need to be digging in and, and managing what's going on right here, right now. And I think uh, as, as a district, we've done a really good job of trying to do that through our Living Through History Cornerstone. Um, and it's a way for every content area, um, including the arts, to to kind of dig into what's going on right now with our students as they are living in this time. And so they've gotten the opportunity to, in each subject area, respond appropriately for that subject about what they're living through. Um, and then the arts in particular, we chose to kind of focus on um, activism and protest and how that can be um, different for everybody. And the great thing about it, our teachers have taken lots of different perspectives on that. We had one teacher who focused on on bullying and did an anti-bullying campaign um, art with her students using Adobe Spark. Um, we've had teachers who have really gotten into um, climate change and what that looks like and, and giving students an opportunity to voice their opinions through the art and music processes. And so, um, and we also have some dance and movement that's happening, which has been really wonderful about how we use our bodies and how we feel in our bodies um, and being able to express in that way. So I think uh, it is, it's imperative that we have these conversations because otherwise it's stuff that gets swept under the rug and then we have little children running around who just don't understand why they feel the way they do but um, integrating this into our curriculum is going to be the best way to kind of manage some of those anxieties really give students an outlet and a way to kind of talk about what's going on uh, again without using words all the time and then really just kind of making sense of stuff that doesn't make sense. None of this makes any sense right now, I think, you know, for any of us. So it's it's a it's a way to make sense out of crazy and, and chaos. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, you're really getting at this notion of authenticity and that young people know when we're not being authentic and that Absolutely. things can happen when we are. And also the agency of teachers to be able to choose these avenues that really feel important and real to them as well. So thank you. Um, going in a slightly different direction, we had a question around, can you suggest art experiences that would facilitate mindfulness? We know that art teachers are doing everything from in-person to remote to hybrid. You know, what, what, how are ways to bring mindfulness into your practice as an art educator? Great question. Um, and again, I think I'll put my therapist hat back on for this one. I think one of the, the greatest things in terms of mindfulness is that ability to be present um, and really allowing students time. Um, it's one of the things that we want to rush through. We have very little time as, you know, classes are online. Maybe our classes are shorter than they used to be. So we want to get right into the art making. Um, but it can be difficult to do that, particularly as, as students and teachers are experiencing lots of anxiety and, and lots of maybe mistrust or all kinds of things are happening right now. Um, so giving, even if it's just that mindful minute in the beginning of a class, um, again, something that's routine, rituals and things that students and teachers can get used to and expect. Um, um, help to really focus in on the mindfulness and allow um, allowing space and time to kind of be present in that moment. I think another thing is breathing. Um, I know it, it seems like the simplest answer, but it is honestly the best thing. Um, I realize that we don't intentionally breathe most of the time. It's such an autonomic thing that we just forget that we can take a deep breath, we can pause, we can take a moment. Um, and I've actually encouraged our teachers to do that more often, especially as they're going from class to class to class online, like literally just taking 
a deep breath um, and, and slowing down and uh, really kind of counting through what they're doing so that that's, we can get there and it's not all extra stressful. Um, and then really just meditative art, I think is one of the, the best things that I like to do, uh, really just breathing and painting and what that looks like, not having a real end goal in mind, um, figuring out ways to just kind of slow down and um, be present, focus on one thing, you know, and, and finding ways to be grounded. Um, and sometimes that's maybe a guided meditation. I love using Insight Timer, which is an app. Um, there's apps like Calm or Headspace that's available for free to educators. So there's lots of things out there that can assist with mindfulness. Um, the key is just being mindful about remembering to utilize those things and, and keeping them as routine and ritual in our practice. Wow, that's a lot of wisdom, Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, and I heard our little cowbell, so I wish we could keep talking, but I'm going to ask you our last question, which is really along these lines, sort of what is your self-care? It sounds like breathing and art are a key part of that, but would love to hear just what you're doing to take care of yourself, Lindsay. Absolutely. I think the, the last thing I'd add to breathing and art is connecting. I think right now, again, many people are feeling very isolated. So finding ways to socially distance connect. Um, one of the things I've done uh, over this summer that has been really fun is uh, what we call a paint gate. We literally drive to empty parking lots and open up our, our um, trunks and paint out of our trunks with some of my artist friends. And it's been a great time to kind of just get together um, be apart, but to still together and really just enjoy each other's company and paint together. Um, I, again, I haven't created a whole lot of product out of that, but really just the idea of practicing and really making marks on the page and on the canvas has been just freeing and allowing that to happen. Um, and, and just being in that moment in that process kind of is like the zen that I always need. So I don't get to do it as often as I would love to, but trying to include art and incorporate art and friendship as much as possible is the way I'm taking care of myself these days. Thank you, we'll keep it up. Uh, it was great talking to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Yes, thank you so much, Karen. Um, and this is great because now I get to introduce uh, our next guest. Um, I'd love to have you all welcome me or welcome with me, Dr. Zarek Clinton who is an educator at Dutchtown High School in Hampton, Georgia, and also a practicing artist. Um, hey, Zarek, how are you? I don't see him. He's muted. Unmute, Zarek. Okay, I'm doing great. How about you today, Lindsay? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, welcome to the conversation. Um, as you've seen, we've covered a lot of ground so far. Uh, and so we're just gonna jump right in to keep our time going. Uh, Julie from Missouri has a good question. And I'd also love to know how are you balancing and caring about your students um, and then balance with mentally and emotionally taking care of yourself as a teacher? Uh, well, I, I have to tell this story before, uh, even before school could start, I knew this was going to be a different year. Um, I got an email from one of my students uh, telling me that he really needed to get in art class. It wasn't listed on the schedule. And it was kind of a, almost like a desperation kind of thing, I thought. So I emailed him back and we kind of talked and um, he told me the kind of things he was working on and um, the types of situation that he was facing during COVID and that art was really helping them with that. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of my students, once school did start, what I did initially was before we could even get to the art making, as you just said, I tried to do some things to get to know the students. Um, in the beginning, I gave them a document to fill out that really just was about learning about their interests, things that they like to do, things that they plan to do in the future. And um, that really helped a lot because I got to know them and then I started to plan lessons based on real world issues that they were dealing with. And that seemed to um, motivate them and it seemed to work well so far this semester. As far as um, myself, I'm kind of um, one of those people that works a lot. So I'm, I'm not sure how good I am with the balancing act for myself. Um, as you said, um, I teach school and I'm also an artist. So if I'm not at work and I'm not doing uh, family things, I'm pretty much in my studio. So, but that's enjoyable for me. It's not like a task. 
That's wonderful. And I think the, the key point of that is that building relationships with students that they want to be in your class, even when they don't have it, is an awesome, awesome thing in the classroom, particularly for art classrooms. Um, I actually do a panel called, or a fellowship called Cultivating Compassionate Classrooms for that very reason. I think it's super important to build relationships with our students so that they can have that freedom of expression and, and know that the art is not just some required elective that they need to have, but also a really a good, cool place where they can come in and, and get it all out. And so that's awesome that your student has desired that and that you were willing to take that, you know, extra step to make sure that they had what they needed. So thank you for that. Um, I'll move on to our next question. It is what strategies or advice do you have for our colleagues here who are needing to keep students engaged while simultaneously maintaining high quality teaching as some of us are in hybrid situations and virtual situations or maybe even in person at this time? Well, we are uh, one of the schools that are in the hybrid situation. I have students online, uh, mostly Google, Google Meets, and then I also have students in front of me uh, in the classroom. So what I do is um, use 15 minute interval, intervals. Mm -hmm. um, I do uh, our first 15 at the beginning of class each day. This is our sketchbook assignment. And after the 15 minutes, I make sure that they're uploading the images to the classroom. And I'm also um, dealing, dealing with the chat box a lot. I'm constantly asking questions. And as we move through the class, I don't do anything that's over 15 to 20 minutes. Even when we're doing studio time, I'll, um, I'll check with them. I'm constantly in the chat. I'm constantly unmuting my mic, asking them to speak to me. Uh, some of them are kind of reluctant to turn on cameras, and some of them are. But I think a lot of times you have to just ask them how they're doing as well. Um, it's not just about you know, the art making again. You know, at the beginning of class, uh, I'll ask them how things are going. Some of them will respond in the chat. Some of them like the chat box. Others like to unmute. So I kind of give them that liberty. And the 15 minute intervals do work well because we're on a 90 minute block. And there's no way to lecture for 30 or 40 minutes and, and to uh, keep the students engaged. So those would be my suggestions. Keep it short, but keep it really um, powerful, impactful. And that, that seems to work. I love that. Uh, I think, you know, even as adults, our attention spans aren't that long as we were on these computers all day. So really having um, short chunks that have lots of power to them, I think is the best way to go. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so that kind of leads directly into this next question, right? So uh, we're all experiencing some level of Zoom fatigue and Diane from Oregon is thinking about this too and has asked us for suggestions for pulling high school Zooming students and staff out of the COVID-19 funk. So what strategies, um, in addition to those that you just named, have worked to really kind of pull students into the classroom? Um, one thing I've learned to uh, use is short video clips. And I use a lot of YouTube. I even go to uh, cbsnews.com to look up different art videos. And the videos that seem to be impactful are the ones that have music with them. The students, you know, they like the music. It's kind of interactive, a lot of energy. And so those types of things that gain their attention to kind of break up the uh, monotony of a lecture would be good. And sometimes I may do this at the beginning of class, right after our sketchbook. Sometimes I put it at the end. So I kind of keep them guessing on when they're going to do it so it's not so monotonous. And also, again, keeping it in short intervals. The 15, 20 minute, that's my rule. I'm always active in the chat box. I'm always checking um, Google Classroom to make sure that they're uploading work. If they're not, I'm in the chat asking them um, if they need uh, assistance. Uh, you know, they need to get engaged. So I try to keep it as close as possible to being um, in a, and not being in a virtual, but a face-to-face -face environment. Very good, that sounds wonderful. I think I, I do a lot of that with my grad students as well. So I think it is applicable across the grade bands um, of really just trying to, to bring in videos and interactive things that are um, culturally relevant and, and, and where the students are right now, I think is super, super helpful. And then also just, 
keeping it moving, right? Not trying to stay stuck on one thing for too long uh, as we're in this space. So those 15 minute intervals, I think are going to be the key for a lot of folks. Um, well, we are at our closing question, which we've all kind of answered, um, but we are curious, what are you doing for self-care? How are you taking care of yourself during this time? Um, and if you have any recommendations for other colleagues out there as well. Well, like Karen said, I try to um, work out like three or four times a week. So I actually uh, went out and got me a treadmill. Uh, so that's helpful. Uh, during the summer, I was, you know, outside a lot in the neighborhood. You know, you can work out outside. But when the winter comes, it's not like Chicago, but it gets kind of chilly in Atlanta. So we're, we went out and got a treadmill. So I, I try to do um, a couple of miles on that a day. And that kind of helps. And also, uh, I, I always rely on the artwork. Everything for me um, starts and ends with that. Uh, my self-care with the sketchbook, I take it everywhere I go. I keep one in my car, I got one at work, I keep one in my bag. So I guess that's my primary self-care because if I got some issues to work out, I'm always doing some type of um, sketching in my sketchbook. So that's that would be my biggest self-care, I think. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Zarek, for your time. And I'm glad to be here with you in this conversation. And I'll let you pass it on to the next group. All right, thanks, Lindsay. Okay, I want to welcome everyone tonight. Next up, we have Alexandra Burnside. She's from Carthage, Missouri. She's an art educator at Fairview Elementary. So uh, we want to welcome Alexandra to the discussion. Hi, Zarek. Hello, how's everything going, Alexandra? Great, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Great, great. It's uh, great to connect with you as two art educators in the classroom. Uh, we kind of we can relate to each other about the virtual learning, the hybrid learning, and those types of things. Um, I guess there are some really nice questions, uh, some really tough ones, but I'm sure you'll be able to give us some insight. Uh, here's a good one to start with. Sarah from Washington is looking for a quick SEL strategies that can be used in the beginning and ending of class. Do you have any ideas you want to share with us? I do. Quick is right. So I see my kids once a week, 50 minutes each time. So we don't have a lot of time to really sit and be mindful. So some good Quick things to try are the five finger breathing technique, which many of you have probably seen before, where you ask kids to spread their hand out like a starfish and you trace the edges of your hand, taking a deep breath in as you get to the end of your finger and uh, an exhale as you get to the bottom. And you're doing this slowly up, pause, down, pause, taking that breath in and out. So you get five deep breaths and then they're ready to get going. Also, you can have students write down something they're stressed about or draw a picture depending on their age and they can rip it up and throw it away or reframe, reframe it more positively and use those little bits to create some kind of mixed media collage. Or um, you could do like Lindsay mentioned, sort of a mindfulness minute where kids are just closing their eyes, using their imagination to escape just for a little bit, then coming back in, maybe uh, or just releasing those bad feelings they might be experiencing. At the close of class, you might think about doing an appreciation, apology, and an aha. So uh, something they loved about class, something they wish they'd done better, and uh, something they learned. Oh, thanks for those uh, suggestions, Alexandra. They, they work really well. I think they could work for adults as well, actually. As you know, the art room can go beyond just our classrooms and studios and connect with our communities. In this remote learning environment, have you found helpful resources to get parents and caregivers on board to support SEL in schools and art museum field trips or virtual visits? This is a question um, Karen asked from Kansas. She's curious to hear your ideas. Thanks, Karen. I have, I'm in, a partner with an organization called Art Feeds that dedicates their time to creating space for children to express themselves grow their social emotional skills and expand their creativity. So you can use art feeds with uh, parents at school. Uh, they have free projects, printables and teaching videos online uh, on their blog. Otherwise you can join art feeds online for a small fee and have access to their full curriculum. What I've done for my building 
is I've applied for Art Feeds Community Assist, which provides training, curriculum, and um, free art supplies for every student in my building. And it's just been amazing for us. Okay, thanks a lot, Alexandria. And Kaylin from New Hampshire is looking for the best concrete examples of social emotional learning lessons for elementary students to move our practice forward. Um, what might you suggest? So part of what I talked about with Art Feeds, and I know that uh, Karen and Mario spoke a little bit about trauma in the classroom. Well, Art Feeds provides one whole curriculum just in response to kids' trauma. And so I brought three examples along. There is a safe spaces painting where you're asking students to uh, think about a person, place, or thing that makes them feel safe. And this is just my example. And they use their watercolors and crayons to create that safe space or draw that person or thing. There's also the um, how to mend a broken heart lesson where students are making a heart out of construction paper and using all kinds of art supplies to mend those hearts back together. They can even write down a time when maybe their heart was broken and, and um, maybe suggest some things that help them mend that heart back together. And lastly, their most favorite was the calming jar. And so we filled these plastic jars full of glitter and beads and sequins, and all kinds of fun things. And um, this is asking students to think about their anxieties and what, what makes them feel calm. And maybe if they just need a little distraction, they can gaze into the calming jar. Okay, and our closing question, what are your tips for self-care? Well, we have a lot in common. I also take my sketchbook everywhere. I try to work on one sketchbook at a time and uh, fill it page, you know, cover to cover. So shout out to Papermate Flare Pens and Papermate Inkjoy because I always carry those are my favorite. Um, so I will use that sketchbook not only just to draw and doodle, but also sort of as a, as a journal where I'm writing down thoughts and feelings as I go through. And if that doesn't cut it, I'll just watch The Office again for the 10th time, and that usually helps. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, my, my sketchbook is really a journal, too. I write in it as well as um, create sketches. So, Alexandra, at this time, we want to thank you for your time, and um, this has been a great interview. Thank you, Zarek. I want to welcome Mario Rosero back to the conversation. Welcome, Mario. Hey, Alexandra. Thanks. You know, I um. I, I kind of wish I would have made one of those jars myself to see you <laughs> hold it up. Oh yeah. Love that. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you know, we've covered a lot of ground in this town hall. So can you tell me from your perspective, what are the key takeaways from this conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so many ideas and I, I tried to take some notes of some of the themes that I was hearing, um, centering, mindfulness, always starting with yourself, um, please excuse the car horn outside. Don't you love live Zoom? I was like, this is real life, folks. My <laughs> cat's going to start meowing at any second. Um, start with yourself and work your way outward. Really lean into and rely on those rituals and routines. And then that communication and connection piece. And, you know, one of the, the things that I heard from each of you was that just remember you're, you're not alone, right? There are colleagues and there's a community. Sometimes they're you know, right next door. And sometimes they might be across the country, but that is one great thing about technology is we can find ways, you know, to, to connect with our colleagues and, and find that support that we need. Absolutely. If you're an art educator and you're not already a member of the National Art Educa Education Association or your state organization, that has provided me with so much support. Going to our Missouri Art Ed conferences and just connecting with those people has truly, uh, help me get through and know that you know all our teachers and and everybody's you know we're working through this together also what would you adv what advice would you give to art educators right now well you know i think everyone you know we get so focused on our students which of course you know that's who we're passionate about serving um it's you know don't put yourself last as the teacher in the classroom or in the virtual classroom like do not put yourself last because it, you know, in the end, it's not selfless because I think it can actually, you can get worn out and just, you know, all these layers of stress are a lot to manage. So, 
you know, one of the reasons we really wanted to talk about self-care tonight was just to remind folks there are all these great options for self-care and they can be built in, you know, when you had that little break or before or after work. And um, so I think that's my number one is like, don't put yourself last, right? Take care of yourself as an adult and as an educator. Uh, and then it's like all those easy things, stretch, breathe, drink lots of water, right? Eat good food and, you know, don't binge watch too much TV, but it's just like the simple things I think are really, you know, that's really where I'd like to focus us is on the educator and the adult that we, you know, we need to love and take care of ourselves for sure. Yeah, uh, that is a great segue into our last question. Taking care of yourself, what are you doing to uh, take care of yourself right now? So like you and Zarek, I have a sketchbook everywhere I go. You know, I've had it, since, you know, I've had one since I was probably 10 years old and, you know, Anytime I have some downtime, I'm sketching or drawing, you know, and for me, like it oftentimes turns into a journal and, you know, things like that. So I'd say my, my sketchbook, uh, I try to do some regular yoga practice and then I got a new cat, Millie. So Millie takes a lot of time, but she's a, wor a worthwhile investment for sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Well, Mario, thank you for your time and your expertise. I've enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Alexander. Great talking to you. Okay, folks. Well, we've had quite a conversation and I'm hoping that everyone got some great ideas from our panel of experts tonight. And I appreciate how active the chat was. And there's also lots of good links and ideas in there. So um, before we get into some additional Q&A, um, can we just do a very uh, thunderous virtual applause for Karen, Lindsay, Alexandra, and Zarek for joining us tonight and sharing their wisdom? Thank you so much for joining us. They're, they're still with us, but I wanted to take that moment to just appreciate and thank them. Um, and also, you know, just sort of re-emphasizing those themes of centering, mindfulness, starting with yourself, rituals and routines. And so um, as I looked across the chat and some of the other questions we got in advance, um, I tried to pull some out that we might not have uh, addressed yet. So. Um, one of the questions, Carolina from Pennsylvania, um, does social emotional learning need to be explicitly taught in order to be effective? And I'm going to kind of open that up to the group. Does it have to explicitly be taught in order to be effective? And start maybe. I think it certainly is helpful. And we often recommend, you know, having some explicit time carved out to you know, practice perspective taking and to act that out and to see what that's like. But, you know, it can be just as powerful to do that in your art classroom and your literature classroom. So I think it's really a both and that yes, carving out that space and time to do that explicitly is good. But if you can do it built into your curriculum, I think it's all the more powerful. Absolutely. Anybody want to add? I can go to the next one. Okay. I'll jump in real quick. I was just going to say, I think in terms of being explicit, where it comes in most handy is when you are the one being that intentional, because then you can help your students grow through it. Um, I think otherwise we kind of stay really surface. Uh, because again, I think the arts, again, naturally lend themselves to, to a lot of these things. Um, but if we're not actually very intentional about it, we will stay very surface level. And I think in order to get our students the holistic tools, we're trying to make sure they have um, being as intentional as possible in including it and and um, it helps you kind of eliminate your biases and really making it equitable across uh, different um, different whole different genres of people and places and things so that you're actually um, getting a, a whole well-rounded version of SEL. I love that. So um, this next one maybe Alexandra and Zarek you can think about it but I wonder if you have any strategies for using art to uh, the question that we got was sort of around like decompression or even de-escalating. Like, you know, when one of my students gets really amped up, what art tools or practices do you find work well if I need to kind of bring someone down a couple notches? I can speak on that a little bit for my littles that maybe don't have the skill to draw things that really express how they're feeling. Uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with scribble art, Sometimes they just need to take that crayon and just go to town scribbling and then flip that page over. We can draw a shape, cut it out, and they've made something productive out of that need just to be angry and get something out of their system. Excellent. 
Derek? Well, uh, Mario, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I guess, a personal story. When I was in college, I, had, I was taking a, a painting class, and I was kind of at a, a point where I was at a block with the, what I was going to do for a topic. So I was really getting frustrated. So I decided to create a series called Frustration Series. And it was uh, of several abstract paintings. And it actually, two of them actually turned out really well. So when I have students that do that, and I kind of, after I have them for a while, I can kind of tell when they walk in that they're having a bad day. And so they said, well, I don't really want to do that right now. I want to paint today. So I was like, okay, well, what colors are you going to use? And so we kind of dialogue about it. And then I kind of watch the colors they use. And I can kind of tell from the color schemes, you know, if, if they're using a lot of reds and bright colors, uh, uh, blacks or something like that, you know, I might kind of ask them what's going on. So I think that's a, a definite way to, um, I guess you say, de-escalate or kind of decompress. Excellent. I love these strategies, like really practical, hands-on, you could put into practice. Um, and maybe we'll do one more. So uh, there was a couple questions around if anyone has suggestions uh, to give to students, like prompts that help students go deeper. So this is probably that, like, that refined place of like social emotional like expression through artwork. Like how do I go deeper with a student to really pull that stuff out in, you know, in the healthiest of ways? Any good prompts or tactics for addressing that? Lydia, I, can, I, can, I can jump in, yeah. I can jump in. I think one of the, the main things is actually leaving the time for that. Um, oftentimes we get so into the art making process that we forget to process what we made. Um, and so really giving students the opportunity while they're creating to take a pause and really kind of reflect on what they're creating. Um, and then as they're done, um, you know, thinking about artist critiques and, and things of that nature at the end, but really giving students, especially like when we're online, small group time where they can maybe jump in a break out room and share something in their piece with with a, a classmate uh, and really just creating time and space for students to really think about their work um, and then I'll plug project zero here I think they have tons of thinking routines that um, if you are just stuck on what to do they there's lots of things to get you started there um, checking out any of their thinking routines I think will give students an opportunity to begin to go deeper in their work I really appreciate that it's like you know wait time listening time, space, you know, and we know how busy, you know, even with Alexander's example, it's like that, that amount of time is so short, but there are ways to, to make it feel longer and to stretch it out. And I really appreciate that. And, you know, I think part of why the arts are so successful in terms of like really expressing complex ideas is because we have a, a practice and a process of refining and working through things again and again over time. And those sort of like sketchbooks and process workbooks and things like that help you to refine those ideas and get them out, which is essentially creating space for those things to develop. If anyone else wanted to jump in for a final thought on that. Uh, Mario, I do have one yeah. comment. I think that um, commentary is good as well. If you have the nice, the right commentary about their images, about what they're thinking about even before they start the process. Uh, sometimes they say, well, I'm not sure what I want to do. And I, I said, well, what are you having as, a, as an idea? And you kind of pry them in terms of the commentary and have just write a couple of sentences and then maybe say uh, something like to, to them like, um, okay, well, let's put together some sketches based on that commentary you just wrote. Like those small thumbnails, just small things to kind of get them started. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just that act of, of like the verbal or written description, right? Like can really sort of push it to the next level. I appreciate that. Well, well, folks, um, I'm glad we got to address so many questions from um, our audience during the conversation and catch a few more here at the end. Um, I want to again, thank all of you for joining us and thank our awesome panelists. I have a couple slides I'm going to pull up just to give you a uh, couple things that you can keep on the radar that are coming up. So my colleagues are gonna bring up these slides much. And um, so first of all, we're really thrilled that immediately available is this download, which is um, a summary of um, expertise and tips from our four guests tonight. So this is downloadable immediately. You can see the website here, you can use the QR code, but this has some of their top tips for SEL and art strategies. So thank you all for contributing to that. And we'll go to the next slide. 
And then uh, this Thursday, we also have our entire research commission is doing a need to know webcast. So all about mapping possibilities in arts education. We're really excited to share that this week. It's a busy week. And then um, a lot of the questions and comments uh, were on a bigger scale around many things that art educators are facing. And so we wanted to make sure that everyone knew that there's a resource that's available to everyone. Um, it's an open resource, it's our remote learning toolkit and there are tools and tips for uh, in-classroom instruction, continued remote and virtual, hybrid instruction, uh, and we're working on a new equity, diversity, inclusion tool that will be coming up, but these tools help to summarize some, some uh, best practices and some getting started tips. So please utilize those and share those as needed. And for those that are really um, working to build that case and make that advocacy and build that coalition of support on the ground or continue that good work, we have a number of open letters, but this open letter to school district administrators and decision makers is really helpful. It makes the case, it pulls on both the heartstrings and the data strings. So it's really helpful and effective. And if you need a tool and you need a voice, this comes directly from the president of our association. Thank you for these plugs. And then I thought I better not miss the opportunity. We just announced uh, recently that our um, national convention in March, it's going to be our first fully virtual national convention. We expect it to be the largest convening of arts educators uh, in a virtual platform. It's March 4th through 7th. Uh, please consider joining us. We always have you know, hundreds of amazing sessions from our, our members across every um, age group continuum and space, whether it's that pre-K to 12, that college higher ed, that museum space, that community space, our researchers, it's really a great way to connect with colleagues and find that community just like we did tonight. So, you know, and if you're not a member, please consider joining us because, you know, this is how I found my connection. I was an art teacher, you know, elementary school in the basement, no other art teacher in the building. And, I, you know, I met a colleague, Alice, who introduced me to MAEA and, oh my gosh, look where it led. So, you know, please consider becoming, uh, you know, part of our membership. And lastly, I just want to make sure you know what's coming up in December. Our next town hall, we heard um, the next uh, topic that people really want to get into is more work on equity, diversity, inclusion. And so we have some really great experts, including the chair of our EDI commission. So we're going to go really sp speaking to how do you move from ideas to action, right? Like, what are those first steps you take? So that's on December 15th. And then on January 26th, there's also something that educators are facing, which is how do I balance my curriculum as an art educator, right? I, I'm teaching in new and different ways that I'm not used to. And so I don't want to overly rely on skills or overly rely on art history, but really do the entire range of from those basic skills all the way up to that conceptual art piece. So how do I balance that out? Some, so some really great thinkers. So um, I can't tell you what February is, even though we have it scheduled, but we are you know, really working hard to bring these to you every month. So in closing, um, please take good care. Thank you again for joining us and please access these resources. Thank you to our audience and thank you to our panelists for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you.